στο όνομα του Πατρός και του Υιού και του Υιού Πνεύματος, αμήν δόξα, Θεός, ελπίσιμον δόξα, βασιλέ φουράνι, παράκλη του Πνεύματος, αληθείας, πανταχού παρών και τα πάντα πληρών, ο θησαυρός των αγαθών και ζωής, χορηγός, ελθέ και σκήνους, νενμήν, και καθάρισουν μας από πάση και λίδος και σώσουν αγαθέτες ψυχάς σημαίνει. Ευχαριστώ πολύ, Ευχαριστώ πολύ, Just wait for the microphone to come. Please answer questions uh, and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. So we had a break. I hope when you enjoyed it as well, it lasted. We're back. And... Um, I wanted to ask you a question because it's like we did 12 um, synaxes about Nipsey and now we had a break and we will move on. So I wanted to ask you from all these gatherings that we did and from everything you might have ever heard about Nipsey what's something that has impressed you most or you think it's extremely important and it could be different for everyone but i would like to hear your opinions because i think it's it's very interesting and very important to know um what's interesting for someone what's helpful for someone where we go next, if there is something we need to analyze more. Um, and then we can move on to questions, if there are any questions. But if we could start with this, you can think about it for a minute. What is the most impressive things you heard about Nipsey? Or what is the most important thing you think you heard about Nipsey? And of course, the same thing can apply to different people differently but just to hear some opinions and some views hopefully there are some Eleni the fridge is very loud this is the fridge it's very loud do we use it? I don't know, I'm just saying That's better. <laughs> All right. See, when we don't have enough nipsy, we need to turn off whatever is annoying. Okay, anyone, anything? Otherwise, yeah. Just a minute. very famous about my memory but <laughs> I tend to agree with people what center okay Thank you. Yes. Just here now.
So if you were to take this and make it like an advice for someone, how would you word it? How would you say? Sorry, an advice for someone? Yes, if you were to take your idea and make it an advice for someone, for a friend, mm -hmm. how would you express your advice based to what you just said? I don't quite understand. Sorry, so... I don't know. So basically, Nipsey doesn't change who we are. It's just that it makes us, it gives us a cleaner version of ourselves, in a way. All right, good.
very interesting and thank you thank you for sharing your experience with us just on that you said something about freedom and I wanted to add a comment a personal comment that um, when I was looking when I was first looking into becoming a monastic I saw one of the times that I saw Yero de Emiliano, one of the first times that I saw my elder, I told him that I wanted to, in a way, put my will under God's will, like Christ on the cross. And he commented and he said, Όχι να υποτάξεις, να ταυτίσεις. Not to put your will under God's will, but to make your will and God's one. So your will to be God's will and God's will to be your will. And this is what freedom is. Um, there was a discussion a few days ago about freedom and um, I think we need to understand that to, for someone to be free it's not to do whatever we please because then we are slaves to our passions and slaves to addictions and slaves to other people's wills. But to be free is to be united with the absolute freedom which is God. And only then we can be free. And you can see that even Jesus had to suffer hunger um, and everything that we as humans suffer from. But this doesn't take our freedom away. It's the freedom of the spirit, the freedom of the heart. And this can only be achieved by uniting ourselves with Christ, with God, with the Holy Trinity. Otherwise, we might pretend that we are free. We might um, fight for our freedom but whatever we fight for is not the true freedom it's something different so freedom is to become one with the absolute freedom which is god and that's only when we are free just a comment on on what you said anything on that all right who else who would like to say what do you think was the most important or something that was most very impressive about the Nipsey that um, you've ever heard? Don't be embarrassed. Your experience can help others. I said this a few days ago, a few weeks ago. It was a talk about humility and um, um, once I was in this talk and I wanted to say something but then I thought maybe it's more humble if I don't talk. And then the, the speaker, who is a very spiritual person, came up to me and said, the humble people talk. And I thought, there you go, I failed. Yeah. So don't be embarrassed to talk because your experience can help others. Okay, thank you. All I wanted to say, and it might help, or it might not, but was what you said was what I was about to say. And it may not be a surprise to many people, but it is to me sometimes how similar we all are in our experiences of these things uh, are universal. We're actually um, very different but very the same in many ways and um, what you said was what I wanted to say as the most important thing and the secondary comment maybe in addition is that um, through Nipsey personally I've been allowed to um, perhaps um, deal with a lot of shortcomings that I, well, I was able to see shortcomings in myself, yeah, and um, perhaps start to uh, just wait 
be patient and wait for God to act instead of me trying to fix those things like I used to in the past. So instead of making efforts myself towards improvement, learning that it's, it's time to take all the thoughts out. And um, the comment you made, I which thought it was, there been so many, but you made a comment about floating in God's grace, letting it go, is, um, is, is a very powerful um, way forward. You just get carried to where you need to go, when you need to go, as much as you need to go. And there have been changes in myself which are very positive and, um, and I know it's not me doing it, so I can't claim any credit for it. So in that sense, it's been a beautiful, humbling experience. And the correct one, finally, all my life I've been trying to be good, and now all I try to be is empty for God to be good within me. And things change. That's huge. First time ever. And I'm 50 plus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm afraid to but yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Mm. The humility, oh, sorry, one more thing, sorry. Uh, uh, one of the biggest shortcomings I've had is thinking that I love people, um, but I haven't. It's only now that I'm empty that I can love people, that I actually it changes the way I act, that I can't believe what I'm seeing around me, finally. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. That was a very nice comment. Thank you for that. Um, just a couple of things. Love can be very tricky because sometimes we don't understand that we love others expecting to be loved back. But that's self-love. That's not unconditional love. And this can be very tricky even within a family. Um, God loves us no matter what. And if anything, He gives us something and he doesn't expect anything in return. We can just take the gift and run. Of course, it's not going to benefit us anything without God. But we usually do that. And he gives us wealth, we take the wealth and we go and do whatever. He gives us health, we use our health to do whatever we want. So he gives us everything and we end up going away from him using his gifts. And then sometimes we wonder why I don't have more. If we have more, we would have been more responsible. So love is, love is a bit tricky. We need to understand this emptiness that you said. Without emptying ourselves, we can't, we can't help others. Everything we do, it's self-centered. But if we try to empty ourselves, then we can benefit others more. And by saying that, I wanted to say the second point that we can try our best to help others, but without God's grace, we can't help anyone. And where does this leave us? This means that we do our best, but then we don't worry about the result. Because God loves our loved ones more than what we do. He created them. And God loves the things that we love more than what we do everything like he's the creator of everything and um, that's why i guess we should be doing our best with everything and then let god do what he wants let god give the result that he wants out of this situation if we try to put our logic into it we can ruin it and this is why sometimes yes this is why sometimes i'm saying that and it sounds weird. Personally, I try not to operate, operate logically. It doesn't mean that I don't have brains, which is true, but it, <laughs> it means that I'm not using them, which is also true. Um, so so I'm, trying, I'm trying, if possible, and it sounds weird, I'm trying to walk on the waves. To walk on the waves, you need to have Nipsey. To focus on Christ, not on the waves. If you focus on the waves, you will sink. You need to focus on Christ. This is how I ended up being in Australia. There was no logic into it. It was just faith. And this is why we're here together tonight. Um, if I was to think 
logically, I would never, for example, start this series of talks because logically they make no sense. It, I basically teach you how not to think, which is the opposite of what the society talks about. So, yes, what, what makes sense for a believer is God, is not logic, is not God's gifts, it's nothing more or less, it's just God, that's it. Um, yes? I don't understand this concept of emptiness when you say empty yourself. Can you expand on that and what you mean by it? Self-emptying. Um, Saint Sophronius talks, which is similar but different, talks about loving God to the point of hating yourself. Um, self uh, hate. And this is not something like seek. This is understanding that everything that we try to do um, based on our own abilities can lead us to the wrong thing. Even if it is something successful, as we said before, if God doesn't bless it, it's not going to be beneficial. And even if we do something wrong, if we do it in a humble way, because this is the best we could ever do, if we do it without, without advertising ourselves, without wanting to attract attention, without being self-centered, if we do it for God, if we do it out of love for the others, just give and have nothing in mind to take back. If we do it in such a way, God can bless it, even if it is wrong, even if it's not perfect. So self-emptiness means that um, I don't care about my ideas. I don't care about what I think is right. I'm not going to defend myself in the family and destroy the peace. Um, I will try and do what the other person wants as far as it's not sinful or hurt someone else by doing so just to keep the peace and by obeying to your wife or to your husband or to even sometimes to your children you keep the peace in the family you empty yourself you empty your will you would have wanted to do something else but you don't because you obey to the law of love and you don't obey to your logic you don't obey to what tells you that it will, it will be the best result. You can, sometimes, I'll give you an example, which is an extreme example, but it's an example that it's in the, from the Herodico. So there were two homo people uh, walking through the desert and they had one guide. So this guide at some point got lost. He didn't realize it or he didn't want to to, to accept it that he was lost. He didn't want to say that he was lost. So he kept going. And there was one from the group that realized that, but for the love of, he didn't want to hurt the other person, he said nothing. So basically they wasted like seven hours walking around in circles. And after that he had to admit, I don't know what I'm doing. Did you realize that we were, we were lost? And the other person said, yes, but I didn't want to hurt you. So, it doesn't matter if we go around in circles, as far as we don't hurt anyone, but what matters is to maintain the love within the family, within the, your friends, within every, with, with everyone. And this is what it means to empty yourself. It doesn't matter what's right and what's wrong. It doesn't matter um, what you would have done differently. Of course, if you run a business like that, you will be bankrupt, so that's not suggested. But, but I'm saying in our personal relationships, um, we need to put the other person first. The devil puts thoughts into my mind saying you're a doormat, you're a pushover. Why do you allow yourself to be like that? I mean, Jesus was no doormat <laughs> and he said what he thought was right. What's the difference between feeling like a doormat and standing up for what you believe? If you go to someone and tell him, if you'd go to someone who says that I'm nothing, I'm not worth anything, 
if you go to this person and tell him you're nothing, you don't worth anything, he will get upset. That's because usually we don't believe these things, we just say them to sound humble. The difference is that, like, again from the Yerodiko, um, St. Moses the Ethiopian, he knew that he was, before he became a monk, he was a, a murderer, he was a robber, he was everything you can even, everything you can imagine. So when he went to the gathering of the fathers, one of them told him, get out of here, dog. And he said, that's right, that's what I am. And he moved out without any second thoughts. But this doesn't make you any lesser um, of what you are, because you are creating the image and likeness of God. And, and the thing is, we usually get hurt if they tell us something, because our values, they are not what they should be. So if they tell us that um, the way you dressed is not uh, uh, fashionable, we might get hurt because our values, they are not where they should be. And if they tell us that um, your idea is not correct, we might get hurt because we want to look smart. And we don't understand that it doesn't matter if I look this way or the other way. What matters is that God loves me. Otherwise, he wouldn't have created me. And if I truly believe and love God back, um, it doesn't matter what happens. So even if they call me a doormat, if they, even if they behave to me like I'm a doormat, it doesn't matter. But see, Jesus, Jesus, um, there was a point that he went to the temple and he kicked out everyone because they were selling and buying things and they made the, the house of his father um, an inappropriate place. But at the same time, when they slapped him, he was silent. So everything we do, we have to do it up um, with prayer. And this comes down to what we said in the humility talk, that if I talk or if I don't talk, you can't say if I'm proud or not, if you don't know my motive, if you don't know my heart. So if I say something which sounds humble, or if I say something which is pathologically, um, I don't have self-confidence and it's a, patholo a pathological situation, you can't tell unless you know my heart and unless you know my motives. So only God can tell what this is. But for us, for ourselves, the way we, sh we should act is that everything we do, we do it out of love for the others. And if we talk, we talk to benefit others and we don't talk to attract attention to ourselves. And if we don't talk, it's for the same reason. If we say that we are rabbis, of course we have to mean it, otherwise don't even say it. But even if we mean it, we need to say it at the right time, the right place for the right reason. If not, just keep your mouth shut. And that's with everything. I don't know if this makes sense. Yes, it does. It does. Yes. But you raised another point, and I don't want to. That's right. This. When you said Jesus got angry at the temple, and a lot of people say that was righteous anger, but you can't qualify anger. Anger is anger, whether it's righteous or unrighteous. And I have a problem with that. I mean, how do you justify? Jesus getting angry and saying that was okay. I'll tell you two things if I remember them because they're about, I'm about to forget them. But anyway, I'll start. Um, Gerdes Emilianos, when he was younger, he was, he had an issue with anger. He was getting upset very easily. And this was a problem for his spiritual life because he was going towards the direction of, of helping others, helping souls. And this was a problem. So what he did, he did a vigil, an all-night vigil himself. He prayed. In the morning, this passion disappeared. Of course, that's here at the We can't do this. But after this passion disappeared, you would see him a lot of times getting, or at least looking like he was getting upset and telling off people. 
personally, he never told me off. But there were other monks that he told them off a couple of times, or more than a couple of times. And this raised the question inside my brain, if he doesn't have the passion of getting upset, why does he get angry? This is because it's the only way other people can understand to stop something. It's not because he was not peaceful when he was getting upset. And you can use this technique with your kids. You have to eliminate the passion of getting angry, but at the same time, when you have to tell them, don't touch this, it's hot, you will burn your finger, you have to be firm. They have to realize from the tone of your voice that this is dangerous, they have not to do it. They can't do this. That's not being angry. That's teaching the right way, because that's what they can comprehend. And I think I forgot my second point. <laughs> um, yes, when Jesus kicked out the people from the temple, there is no such thing as righteous anger. Recently, I was talking with someone who is a very spiritual person about justice and love. And you know what he told me? He told me that, what's the opposite of love? Can anybody tell me what's the opposite of love? Because he asked me this question, and I answered and I was wrong. So what do you think is the opposite of love? Just... Indifference. Anyone else? Keep trying. You won't find it. Huh? At least the question that I was told. It, huh? Sorry? What is in Greek? Mm. I'll tell you what is in English, don't worry. Anyone else? So, he told me that the opposite of, of love, I thought that the opposite of love is um, selfishness, because the one is loving someone and the other one is loving yourself. So I thought this is the opposite. But no, he said the opposite of love is justice. justice. Yes. And this is because there is no justice according to God. God is the most, and don't get me the, right, the wrong way, we said we don't use logic here, right? God is the most unjust being. Because if he was just, we would all have been in hell now, like literally. It's a single one of us. We would have been dipped in there up to the... Yeah, and um, a little bit more. Uh, so God, God is not just, is the most unjust. Like you see the parable of the prodigal son. He gave up, he, he basically destroyed his father's inheritance, like totally. And then his father gave him the first place in his household. How is this just? How does this make sense? Or Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, and Jesus gave, became human and gave his blood for us. How is this just? This is the extreme unjustness, if there is such a word. I don't even know if there is such a word. Um, so the opposite of love is justice. And this is why when we try to justify ourselves, we don't have love. And usually within the family, we try to justify ourselves. But if you love someone, you don't try to justify yourself. You try to show him that you love him, that you love her. And this is what it is. It's not about justification. It's not about being right. It's not about anything. It's about the family to go ahead, to move on, to go towards God. That's what it's all about. It's not about justification, but we have bad habits, we are addicted to our justification and we need to detox. It is what it is, it takes time, just keep it in mind though. What else? You're afraid of the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, it is, um, for example, Amata, the God. Um, he loves God very much. And so he's, in the end, he shows, or she shows that they're a true friend of Christ if they have to, if that's the position they're put in. And I think that I understand what you're saying about justice. I think, can, is that coming from like a bathos? Bathos of ego and... It can also come from narrow-mindedness. It can come from a lot of things. Yeah. Like the Pharisees, they were narrow-minded. They want to justify everything. Yeah. yeah. So, like, a lot of things aren't love. So, justice is that doing that isn't love. But I think the opposite is that example of what the martyrs give in the end. Does that make sense? I understand that you raised a point which is interesting. Yes. So well, fear. Is, yeah. Is, this is love. That's not love. That's not love. What you're doing, that's not love. You can say that. But yes. the actual opposite. Mm -hmm. And I think I didn't. I did. I heard that once, and I had to really think about it. I heard someone talking. It was another person, and um, I forgot all about it. And then I happened to hear something again a couple of years later and I remembered. And because I've had that time to forget and to think about it and to hear something new again, um, I tried to make sense of what I had yeah. So sorry if I'm using my logic too much. No, that's right. <laughs> From what you're saying, I understand, which is a valid point, that when we're afraid of something, the first instinct that we have is to justify ourselves. But the problem is that sometimes we're afraid of our image in the family, for example. Like a father, if uh, the son realizes that the father is wrong, uh, his image might be destroyed. And out of fear, the father will try to justify himself. Sometimes it might work, but sometimes it's better to be the bigger man, if this is how you, you would describe it, and say to your son, um, no, I'm wrong. I have to take responsibility for my mistake. I'm wrong. As simple as that. And if the son has a little bit of common sense, will realize that... Um, this is what it is to be real, not to try and hide behind your finger, not to be afraid that people might think something of you that you're not. Anyway, it's, it's very sensitive, all these issues, they're very sensitive. And yeah, it's not black and white. Yeah. And I anyone guess, else? I, I was challenged because uh, I can orthodox person sat down and wanted to talk to me. And um, do you want me to hold it in your shrink? And, um, and he was suffering and he couldn't go to see his pastor because of the lockdown mm -hmm. and everything. And obviously he has some mental issues kind of from before and he knew me and um, I guess I wasn't in a very loving mood at that moment, but I, <laughs> because he was having a bit of an episode. Um, but when I realised that I wasn't being very patient, um, because he was kind of insisting, oh, why don't, why can't I do this or this in your church? Why can't I demand this time of your priest? Because I need time, I need. And, um, I thought, how am I going to, how do I tell someone? Um, so I made him a cup of coffee and he ate something that was there. And, um, and I tried to understand his criticism and then he was saying, well, you know, we're all Christians, aren't we? No. Why can't I 
the madness of, um, of being in church, of the whole priest. Mm-hmm. I was really stuck. Is this kind of irrelevant? Sorry, it's irrelevant. I'll make it relevant. It's about love. What is love? What is the love? And uh, I was trying to be loving, but I didn't know how to be firm in a way. And at that moment, like, no theological discussion was going to help because he wasn't interested in theology about differences or anything. So that's why I just tried to, I just was straight to him. I, I said, look, um, I rang up his pastor, left a message for him, saying he misses you. And I made that offer, called him, and I said, if you're interested in our church here, um, I can give you some, let me know and I'll give you some information about, about the church and the differences. Do you understand? I was sort of stuck on, you know how people claim love is all these things and if nothing else matters. If I may say a couple so of things. I was a bit stuck and I just, kind of, I, mean, I wasn't very inspired, so mm. maybe I'm asking a question now, how to handle okay. the situation. So the first thing that comes in mind is that if someone um, has obvious psychological issues and they're advanced they need someone who knows how to deal with them and ourselves we might not be qualified to uh, jump into deep waters but another thing that comes in mind is that people they might come to us with real issues we don't always need to give them solutions just sitting down there, listening to them, telling them that we understand their problem, even if we don't have a solution, and that we will be there for them, regardless what happens. This can make them overcome their fears, overcome their problems, and themselves they will find their way out. We don't, we don't need to be wise. Okay, maybe if I tell you a bit more. So he ended up confessing his sins to me okay. when he, he wanted our priest to hear him and do confession and regardless of the fact that he wasn't orthodox and wanted whatever but he was he, he was on his way out to do a call and um, and yeah so that was kind of the situation and he was saying bad things, you know, in his convoluted thinking that, oh, he doesn't like me, um, that's why I want it. And then I'm saying to him, but you're not in, you're not in All right, we should not stay in this one situation, but, but, but if someone comes and tells us that they did this and this and this and it's like a confession, we should tell them that they we don't necessarily need to tell them to stop. We just need to gently tell them that they need an actual confession. Because you can't give forgiveness of sins, especially to an unorthodox. It can't happen. And because you're not a priest. No, but I mean, I didn't want to hear it, but he just had such a great need. Yeah. Um, you can't, you can't, if someone needs to talk, you have to be there. You can't just not be there. But if you yourself can handle it, don't even encourage someone to talk. But if you can handle it without damaging your own spirituality, it's all right. So we need to know ourselves before we get into all this. And then we need to know if the other person suffers and what they suffer from and direct them to the right direction. So, it, so for all this, you need to talk to your spiritual father. Oh, okay. Okay? Right. Good. It's just hard to say. When they say, please, please sit down, I need to mm-hmm. talk. I understand, but your spiritual father will tell you your limits up how much can you get involved with someone else's life and how much you shouldn't get involved, even if this is just listening. Well, how to say no? How do I, how, how could I have walked away? I'm not telling you to say no or to walk away. 
I'm telling you to ask your spiritual father what to do in such cases because he knows you as a person. So, to, to be loving, mm. sometimes it's tricky. That's what we said, it's always tricky. But, but your spiritual father will tell you how loving to be because sometimes we think that this, that we're doing shows love. Okay. When it could be us just trying to, I'm not saying that this is the case, us trying to find out things and tell others. I'm not saying that this is the case, but there are a lot of people that they gossip around and they think that this is love and then they can't keep their mouth shut and then everyone knows about everything. So this is why the right direction is to ask our spiritual father what we can do and what we can't do and go from there. All right, back to the actual question, which was where we started. Um, no, that was not the question. The question was, the question was, um, from everything you've heard about Nipsey, what do you think is the most important or something that you were impressed by? What, what you just said now about justice being the opposite of love. Um, it's interesting because I guess the mindset in at least Western society is to an extent guilt-based, or at least historically kind of has been. Sort of like you reap what you sow, both good and bad, it's very black and white. Like I know when I went to the US um, last no, eight years ago, and uh, I spoke with someone there, and I said the first Puritan settlers who went to, um, um, you know, the first people who went there, they first built a church, and the second thing they built was a prison. So, I'm not saying that's all of Western society, but at least from my experience, um, it seems like um, it's quite a foundational kind of aspect. So I think what's hard to understand is what, um, I don't know how, how to articulate that, this, but just moving away from this mindset of and that might sound simplistic, but... So your question is how to move away from this mindset? Well, because I understand... how you judge situations or you judge at all. Yes. I, I understand what you're saying is that in the name of God, we can tell people what to do or we can tell people that they're not doing the right thing. And we can put labels on people. This is this and this, he is this and he is that and this and that. The, yeah, these things, they happen. But first of all, if you want to get away from this mindset, and I'm not saying you personal, but in general, you need to find a spiritual father that does not have this mindset. Um, and the second thing is how they say, OT, they say that um, just realizing something is the 50% of the solution. So once you realize that there is a problem there, this attitude, this way of, of facing things is not right, then even if you can't do anything straight away to fix it, you know that something needs to be done. And, and you will, sooner or later, you, you will find a way to deal with it. But this is what you said is, is spot on. We are, using, we are using God to create guilt into people's hearts to tell them that you do this, you will go to hell. This is not God. This is our narrow mind. And this is us advertising God as a punisher who's not. And I don't know if we keep doing that, even priests do that. If we keep doing that, I don't know where we will find ourselves in the next life. Because that's not fair. This is not how you get people close to church. This is how you get people being afraid of God. God is not something to be afraid of. God is something, God is love. You need to love him and, and he loves you regardless of what. So this is a very important point, but the first step to snap out of it is to find the right environment that is not judgmental like that and does not put labels on people. Putting labels of, on people, it's like a crime. It's not proper, it's not spiritual. It, it's not going to work for our spiritual life and it's not going to help anyone around us. Your grace, I, I think that's a 
very important point that you make that people use God as an excuse to criticize others and to set what the law is. And the thought that came in my mind as you were talking was about homosexuality. Where does that sit? I mean, you know, people would say God says in Acts or in whatever, homosexuality is not of that. And by doing that, you do put labels on people and you do judge them. What does the Orthodox Church view homosexuality as? I will tell you what St. Paisios said to someone who sort of entrusted him with this issue. And this is written, you can read it, you might have already read it. So a boy went there and he told him, Yerda, I suffer from this passion, what should I do? And Ayos Paisios said, do you go to church every Sunday? He said, I do. Do you go for confession when you need to? I do. Um, do you go and help people that you think that they need help? I do. Do you give this amount of money for charities? I do. So basically, she told him like 20 things that not everybody does, and they were difficult. And this kid was doing all these things. And then he told him, he told him, if you do all these things and you can't do just one thing, which was his problem, God will take care of this. Just keep doing what you're doing. We don't, we can't judge the way God does. We, we are, if we're not holy, we cannot judge the way God judges. So we might as well not judge at all. I understand it's a problem and I understand that the person who suffers from this sort of thing, sometimes they find it very difficult. But how would you describe someone who has the passion of, um, let's say, gambling? And um, they can waste, um, they can lose their home. They can destroy their family. They can sleep on the streets. And still they can't give it up. A passion is a passion. We don't know how much these people suffer and we can't judge them. But we should keep in mind that we should definitely pray for them. And if this person has good will, God will show him or show her a way out or give them strength to move on in their lives. Yeah. We should not put labels to people on people. It's terrible. It's terrible. If we don't agree with someone that has a passion, we can keep away, but we should never label people. It's not nice. Yeah. Your Grace, um, going back to what you said like, in one of the earlier talks, you focused on who we surround ourselves with and then kind of like like-minded people um, could you also say, like, becoming more like-minded to the people you're with? Or just, like, thinking of how you're treating people or the, the things you're doing could also impact why you're surrounded by certain people? Yes, I think it works both ways. The only thing is, if you manage to surround yourself with people that they have nice qualities, you should um, imitate these qualities. But if you happen to have friends that they have a couple of qualities that they're not as good, don't imitate these ones. But, but generally, um, in Greek they say, so show me your friends and I will tell you who you are. So usually the ones we associate with in the long term is the ones that we can feel comfortable with and they're the like-minded people but if they have some qualities that we think they're spiritual they're good they are useful we should imitate them as well yeah. and make ourselves better yeah, of course anything else yes your grace reflecting on the lipsis talks and thinking about focus and focus on Christ. Sometimes when we, we think we're close in the church and we do all the right things, we say, and a uh, challenge comes, uh, we, we try our focus when things are going right, but when a 
big cross or a big problem comes in our life, we realise how far away we are from Christ because our focus it's got to goes. Yes. Um, and that's very different to other people that may not be so close per se in the church, but when they have a problem, they run to the church and they hear this in. How, and it's difficult because we realise how far we are from Christ when we run. How can we exercise that muscle? Because sometimes it's we just before we get up, before we get up, what other things can we do? To practice focusing when it's most needed. That's the question, right? Yes. Yes. If if you practice it with small things, then it's easier to practice it when things get tougher. That's why we say that vigilance is not something that you start, you practice it for half an hour a day and then you forget all about it. I'm not saying that you should force yourself to think about it all the time, but what I'm saying is that, as you said with the muscles, the more you train a muscle group, the more it grows. And that's what happens spiritually as well. The more you practice Nipsey, the more you can activate it when you need it. And it's the same with prayer. The more you pray, the more your mind will automatically go there when you need it. And then you see that if something happens, which is also a natural instinct, but you will say Panayemu if, if you in front of a car accident or something. This is a prayer, calling Panayemu's name. This is a prayer. Um, but you will also see that, let's say, if you practice Jesus' prayer, you will realize that in your, in your sleep, you will find yourself saying Jesus' prayer. That's a matter of practice. It's the same with Nipsi. When you, that's what we talked about. When you, the more you practice Nipsi, the more you will see the attacks before they attack you. So then when they attack you, you will say, I was expecting this. That's nothing new. And you're already prepared. But you need to practice Nipsi to be able to have this strength. So the more, the more, and, and Yerdes Emiliano says that the first step of Nipsi is to try and practice Nipsi, but the second step is exis, meaning means it becomes a habit. Like anything, um, when, you, when you cook, if you chop a lot of things and you learn the right technique, you can chop quicker. If you get an amateur to chop, forget about it. I've, I've experienced that, it's very annoying. So, so, but if you, if you chop like a chef, you know how to protect your fingers, you know how to chop things quickly, and you're done in, in two seconds. It's the same with Nipsey. When you know how to protect your intellect, um, you do it automatically. You don't need to think twice. And then the attacks that will become bigger and bigger sometimes, but it doesn't matter because you know the way. And even if you struggle a little bit, you know how to deal with it. Make sense? We don't have time. We can say a couple more things. We don't have time, but I wanted to ask another question. Maybe, maybe we think about it and we talk about it next time. Which question would be, I have to write down because I will forget it myself. Um, how do you personally um, find the best ways to practice Nipsey? But I, I won't even be able to read my writing, but it's all right. It's recorded. Okay, that's for homework. Um, but um, yes, anyone, anyone, anything else regarding what you thought was interesting that we said about Nipsey in the past? I was going to say that two things. The first thing is one thing that I felt that helped a lot was the idea that thoughts come regardless. 
Um, but our thoughts are not ours at the end of the day. Yes. So practically, if you know this thought is bothering you, if you just think it's not yours and you just go and keep doing the duty and focusing on Christ, then that that was very solid. So the thoughts are yours. Um, it's you know we know it's wrong. The second thing I liked from the religious talks is the, the fact that with Nietzsche you're always focusing on Christ and that's been a major theme in all these talks in one way or another. So it's very consoling just to focus on Christ because often we focus on maybe virtues and that, that's too overwhelming. How can I obtain this? Or we focus on passions in, like in other instances and that is also overwhelming. But we focus on Christ. That's not the And that's what I like about Spot on. <laughs> Good. Very important. Both points. Very important. I just need to say one thing. The thoughts might be from the tempter. Might be because we're tired. Sometimes might be because we ate something funny. It, our stomach is like the second brain. Um, sometimes it might be because there are thoughts. Like this example with the ascetic who had an oil lamp in his room and um, he made, he created something that he could put an egg on the top. By the time he finishes his reading, the egg was boiled and he would eat it. It was cooked and he would eat it. And then the abbot found out and told him, uh, Pater, why are you doing this? And he said, um, the tempter gave me this thought. And then the devil appeared and he said, I knew nothing about it, he taught me. <laughs> uh, so, so sometimes the thoughts are ours. But that's not to shock us, that's not a problem if we understand that even if they're ours, it doesn't make any difference. We are humans. If we have a very high idea of ourselves, of course, we will feel disgusted with the thoughts. But if we understand that we are humans and we are nothing, especially without God's grace, we are nothing, it doesn't matter if the thoughts are ours or not. We deal with them equally. We just re reject them. But that's very important because then we realize that even if I'm hungry and the thought about it is mine, who cares? If I want to eat, I will eat. If I don't want to eat, I won't. I'm still in charge of what I will do. I'm still in charge of where I will direct my intellect. So it doesn't really matter where the thought comes from. And that's why the fathers of the church, they say, don't even bother asking yourself, where does this thought come from? Just throw it away altogether. And that's it. But these two points are very important. Mm -hmm. those thoughts even if they're, they're not yours, like if you just keep rejecting them, how are you going to remember to confess them? Like how do you... You're talking about uh, cooking the egg? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What Elder Milenos used to tell us is that you ignore all thoughts, but if there is a thought that repeats itself, it means that it's not just a thought. There is something that bothers you. There is something that you need to look into. Not you, your spiritual father will tell you. So the thoughts that they keep repeating themselves, you have to confess them to your spiritual father. Mm -hmm. Or if there is something that troubles you a lot and it changes you, changes your mood and everything, and you can't, you can't escape from these are things that you need to mention. Otherwise, a thought might come right now, I would love to kill Yerda. <laughs> Just ignore it. Or whatever, but yeah. <laughs> no, whatever. yeah. Just ignore it. I hope you will. Yeah. But if it keeps coming, you have to confess it. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> 
because it's a problem, even if you don't kill me, it's a problem still. You know what I mean? Just putting it out there. All right. Anyone else? Good thoughts are good as far as they are not while we are praying. When we are praying, if we have good thoughts, we will have bad prayers. Because we will be thinking, we will not be praying. So, when it comes to actually practicing Nipsi during prayer, the thoughts they need to go away. And then, if a good thought comes during the day, you can pray about it. Uh, you don't think while praying, but you can pray about the thought. There's a difference there. And um, if you feel peaceful with the thought still, then you can go ahead and do as much as you can towards this thought. But if you don't feel peaceful, it's not going to benefit anyone. Yeah. Just on that point about thought, sometimes um, you start thinking without realising, and then once you've actually had the thought, you stop and go, oh, I've already thought about that. You, you sort of don't even think about it, and it just comes because you're so emotionally thinking. So how do you think? Yes, that's nothing to worry about. It happens to all of us. Uh, at some point, we might be daydreaming, right? So once you realise it, you snap out of it. But don't stress, ah, oh, I thought this, is this a sinful thought, or this or that. Don't worry about it. Even, even our best thoughts, if you were to compare them with God, they are rubbish, trust me. So it doesn't make any difference if your thought was bad or good or anything in front of If you were to compare it with God, it's rubbish altogether. So as soon as you realize that you were, your mind was occupied with a thought, just practice your nipsi and that's it. Don't look back. Never look back. If you look back, you regenerate the power of the thought. Especially, and the fathers of the church, they say about this, especially if these thoughts, they, they are associated with passions. You can't rethink them because this is the the opposite of Nipsey. This will, will inflexuate your imagination and it will lead you to more thoughts and more, more headaches. So these memories, they need to be kicked out. And yes, once you realize that, even if let's say you had a fantasy or a memory or something, once you realize that it was there, it's there, from the moment you realize, practice your Nipsey, say Jesus' prayer, move on. All right. Anything else? Hey Grace, this is a question about Jesus' prayer and thoughts um, coming while you're praying the Jesus' prayer in other, other talks you've given and saying you need to focus on the words of Jesus' prayer. Sometimes I focus on the words of Jesus' prayer and I feel um, compunction. Meaning? So, compunction. I feel, I feel sad for my sins and I'm asking for forgiveness on the sinner. Sometimes I feel, and, and I get overwhelmed with, with a feeling of, of thankfulness to God and glory. Like, are they thoughts or are they. They're the feelings. Same They're feelings. They're feelings. Is that right? Should I be sort of cutting myself off, stop feeling, stop this? Because you need to focus on the words of the Jesus prayer and empty yourself and not feel anything mm -hmm. while you're saying the prayer? Or do you all right. First of all, right if, if you are to practice Jesus prayer, you need a spiritual father who knows about Jesus prayer. Otherwise, 
you will learn the hard way and sometimes it's not the safe way. Um, now, when we practice Jesus' prayer, we go through different experiences from time to time. One time you might start praying and you might have tears. Another time you might start praying and have sadness. Another time you might have joy, you might feel love. Regardless what all these things are, some are from God and some are not from God, regardless what all these things are, you should mostly keep focusing on the prayer. And by doing this, I'm not saying to try to avoid a sense of happiness, because a sense of happiness will help you more with your prayer. But if you were, for example, to focus on tears, the tears, they have a sweetness that they will get you away from the actual focus, which is Christ. So it's like Christ gave you a gift and you occupy yourself with a gift. But what you want is Christ. It's not his gifts. So you can put all, all aside and keep focusing on Christ. And by doing so, it might look like you're putting aside important things, which they are important. They are also gifts. But you will end up you will end up eventually being united with Christ, which is above all these experiences. And that's where you should be focusing, not not on the little lollies that you get on the way. But sometimes because we don't know anything else, we think that this emotion, this feeling is so incredible, and it is. You can enjoy it for a little bit, but don't focus there. Focus on Christ. Keep going. Yeah. But there are times that we go through rough patches, and if we were not to have these little lollies, we wouldn't have made it. So they, they can be very useful. Yeah. Do I make sense? Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. We said quite a bit, and uh, we didn't even touch the book tonight, which is good. All right. So maybe next time, think about the question. How do you personally find the best ways to practice Nipsi? So you can come prepared and we can talk about it. And we also had a couple of questions from emails about Nipsi. We didn't get the time to answer them this time. Hopefully next time. And uh, we'll go from there. Now the next one will be on the 27th, God willing. Same time, same place.